Well, everyone, welcome to uh, our first History and House of 2023. Welcome to the Henry and Anna Oberholzer Mansion, the carriage house of the Henry and Anna Oberholzer Mansion. My name is Shampoo Banks. I'm Executive Director of Preservation of Oklahoma. And um, I love to drink, and I love history, so that's how this event started last year. And uh, I, uh, I'm really excited for tonight's presentation. We had some great ones last year, and there's some former presenters in the room as well. It's from Starstruck. June, Linda, it's just really to have you here with us. And uh, uh, if you ever need speakers, Linda, Jose, and June Chavez, they're they're for hire all the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I I met Michael Schwartz oh early in my time here at, at POK, and uh, we have with uh, Abandoned Oklahoma and Abandoned Atlas Foundation and now Prairie Nation Creative. Right. Um, they have, the uh, Abandoned Atlas Foundation has been um, so helpful in nominating several places that end up on our most endangered places list every year. And then uh, took it upon themselves this last year to help us create a most endangered places archive on our website. They helped us uh, get all 30 years, 29 years of our most endangered places listed on our website with as much up-to-date information um, as we could, as we could find. Uh, speaking of most endangered places, the cutoff for nominations is February 1st. That is next week. If you haven't nominated something, if you know a building, please do. Um, our nomination list is a little on the skimpy side this year, so I'm hoping to find a few more uh, properties to include on the uh, nomination list. Why we're here tonight, why invite Michael here tonight, which was supposed to be in December, but COVID reared its ugly head, and we had to postpone here until January. Um, we know um, oftentimes about tax credits, uh, national register, all the technical stuff that's the, uh, such an important part of our historic properties here in Oklahoma and across the country. What we don't get to focus on all the time is the emotional aspect, the emotional appeal that historic properties or abandoned properties have. Um, especially with the people who lived, worked, and played in those abandoned properties. And Michael and his team um, have, uh, are, are, I don't know if there's anybody better in, around creating these um, heart-tugging uh, uh, appeals for historic preservation. And so Michael's going to uh, show us lots of goodies tonight and talk to us about how we craft that narrative. Um, for so please welcome Michael Schwartz with uh, Prairie Nation Creative. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to try not to drink too much of that tonight because uh, it might help me loosen up. So thank you so much for having me, Gentry. I, I love working with Preservation Oklahoma. Um, you know, I, I started with uh, Abandoned Oklahoma back in, I want to say 2011 when I was just in high school, just kind of doing it for fun. And as I kind of found my voice and found my passion of, of documentary filmmaking. Um, I turned that uh, fun nature into something that I love doing every day. So, um, oh, there's the clicker. So, um, whenever we started, a or whenever Abandoned Oklahoma was founded, it was just Oklahoma. And then when I moved to Arkansas, uh, started Abandoned Arkansas, and then basically that's why Abandoned Atlas was born, because we wanted to put all of those under one umbrella. That was kind of the essential thing there. So tonight, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about a story guide's, uh, storyteller's guide to preserving history and why, how the emotional pull can help in the saving of places or uh, some different nominations or even telling the story of something that has been saved and how um, that can help influence other places to be saved as moving forward um, if, if it's told uh, and the right people are interviewed. Um, and so this is a trailer for a documentary I uh, came out with last year, and it's, uh, it's kind of what inspired the Abandoned Atlas Foundation or the mission of Abandoned Atlas Foundation where it is today. Um, I'll kind of play the trailer and see if there's any questions after that. What is it that makes your city worth living in? It's your city's history. It's the soul. It's the culture. My name is Michael Schwartz. My friends and I love exploring and documenting abandoned buildings to tell their stories, and the Majestic Hotel in Hot Springs, Arkansas, was something that fascinated us from the moment we walked in. Majestic was one of the great hotels in the South. It 
it was this huge, sprawling complex full of restaurants, drugstores, a bathhouse. When this place captured my soul, I wanted to help somehow. And that's when I met Brenda. Maybe there's a way I can form a movement to actually restore that hotel and save it. This historic, majestic hotel is in some seriously bad shape. It shouldn't have been allowed to get that way. That's called demolition by neglect. If you allow a roof to be compromised, you're, you're sentencing that building to death. This place is burning to the ground. Turning this beacon into a den of ashes. The red brick was spared from this fire. After the fire, people from all across the state wanted to make sure Hot Springs history would be protected. What you have there is a building that needs a champion. It was pretty obvious the fire did not start internal to the building, and that seems really strange. Well, the city's plan is to wipe this out. We need to polish it. We need to bring it back. All of the department heads had been banking on getting that property and demolishing it. I want to see it gone. This city has been mafia for years, and if you're not in that loop, you're not welcome. I will not prohibit them from having a voice. Well, some of us want to watch NCIS. <laughs> consumed by the history that is in this city. Could the Majestic Hotel be saved? And so, no, that was not a shameless plug uh, that you can purchase that documentary. But um, the, the motivation behind that documentary was uh, because I had a love for that building and I wanted to see it restored. And there was an effort in Hot Springs to find, to, to help give that building a voice and um, and I just kind of started following the story and falling in love with it more and more and um, unfortunately we did lose it but my goal uh, with what I do now is to try and help that from happening again so um, that is that so why <laughs> why are ban abandoned buildings so cool to explore anybody anybody have any uh, thoughts on that but I <laughs> I, I love them I mean even to this day I mean they're so cool and they're so emotional but I mean the experience, at least for me, going into a place is it might be gone tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. Abandoned buildings, you know, when we have something like the Overholzer Mansion, you know, it's not going to go away tomorrow. And, you know, um, we don't know when um, a demolition might occur overnight without them warning us. <coughs> First Christian Church, excuse me. <coughs> so we don't know. But that's kind of the when you're there, you're taking photos and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, discovering something that may have been lost for years. So this was actually out of a church uh, here in Oklahoma City, it was called Mount Pleasant. And I found an old uh, enrollment uh, thing for in their church and uh, that has now been burnt up. It caught on fire maybe three months after we went and took some photos there. Um, but finding cool things that may not exist tomorrow, again. Um, and this was in the Majestic Hotel, but discovering what was left behind. You know, it's interesting to me how much stuff is left behind sometimes in these places and, and what story they have to tell as you're going through. Um, and the feeling, for me, it, there's a more of an emotional pull sometimes, like, but, you know, being in a place alone where time is just stopped, you know, sometimes it's a time capsule where just when all that stuff is left behind, I mean, this was in, uh, this was in uh, Spencer, Oklahoma, this was the old Dungy High School. Um, that has also, I think the theme of this tonight is fire, um, apparently, but this also burnt down uh, about a year after I took these photos. So, uh, and that was one of my very first places I ever went to um, before it caught fire. Uh, and, the, and the quiet sounds of, of a structure just being left behind, this is an old factory in Stryker, excuse me, that was the name of it, uh, Stevens, Arkansas, this is the old Stryker Paper Corporation plant. Not really an architectural gym, but you know, it's interesting just seeing all the machinery just kind of left there, stuck, stuck in time. And I don't know if I need to tell you what this place is, uh, anybody? All right, this is First Christian Church um, before that happened. But hearing the stories of people who used to go there, I mean, as you know, when we're going on social media, how many times have we you know, posted, a, posted a picture of the First Christian Church and those comments just go down and down and down about, oh, I used to go here, I used to love that. And you know, it's just, it's so fascinating just to hear everybody who used to have memories there and that's part of what um, drives me to to continue to to do this um, and apparently I do play oh no I went up okay I hit the wrong button and this is Dungey after the fire but after so many years of exploring like I said after years of exploring abandoned places for fun I wanted to help give these dilapidated dilapidated structures a voice something that can help 
shed the, put them in the positive light that they need to be. Because yes, while exploring abandoned buildings are fun, while, they're in, uh, while they are fun in that regard, the problem that we have with abandoned buildings right now are what? People go in there to graffiti, spray paint, you know, like, oh, we're gonna go in there and find a, find a ghost, paranormal activity, you know, even though that can be fun, sometimes that's not the, the positive light that we wanna put on these buildings. And so um, how can we change that image? How can we migrate that, uh, how can we migrate that, uh, that feeling of Let's put some emotion behind it. Let's find out why this building is important, what it served to the community, and how it might be something else. And not every building can be saved, and we're gonna get into that. But uh, anybody know where, the, where this one is? It's here in Oklahoma City. This is the old Oklahoma City Public School Administration building. This is the old pool that's in there. Um, and um, there is, I don't know where we're at on that, but I think there, it's in demolition, or it's in danger of demolition right now, kind of, it's in a gray area right now, but in my opinion, just because it's abandoned doesn't mean it's that it's the end of the story, because when we hear abandoned, we think, oh, it's closed, it's too far gone, it's things like that, but again, changing that image. So, I hope you're enjoying your beer, because this is a little video that we put together about where you're drinking your beer from. If it don't... The iconic Sunshine Cleaners building at Northwest First and Classen in Oklahoma City sat abandoned with everything still left inside since the 1980s. From rusting industrial washers to molding carts, the interior fell into disrepair due to the previous owner's decision to dismantle the roof. And the guy who was gonna buy it said, well, I'll pay you less because I'm going to have to tear your roof off. So the guy, in thinking that he would increase his, his sell price, he went and actually tore the roof off of his own building, thinking that he would you know, be able to close and make a little bit more money, and the buyer walked. After the failed attempt at selling the building, this structure lost its shine, housing only transients and Mother Nature. But in its heyday, this structure used to light up the town. In the late 1920s, Sunshine Cleaners opened its doors for business, and like many industrial cleaners at the time, it boasted amenities such as a large facility with a convenient drive through drop-off and pickup. but one of the standout features of the building itself was its brilliant neon sign. The sun rays would emanate out and flash out, and as a kid I always remembered seeing it and driving by and just thought that sign was kind of a beacon almost to this part of town. And that was an important thing, because there was a cleaners on every corner. In competing with many neighboring cleaners, Sunshine's marketing and location brought in business for many years, but slowed tremendously with the rise of household washing machines in the 1950s. By 1986, they were no longer able to hold on, and the sign lit up for the last time. That is until 2015, when the Pivot Project purchased the building. With their tenant and co-owner, Joel Irby, they put together a brilliant plan to utilize the industrial open space for a brewery. We've got a roof now, which is nice. The main thing that made this place really usable and great for a brewery is, is the high ceiling. There were certain changes we did have to make, but as far as the exterior of the building, we wanted to change as little as possible just because it's, it's so cool right now. And the sign, the same thing, I mean, it was ne never even a thought to not restoring the sign. I mean, that, that's like the most iconic part of this building. The night they turned the sign on the first time after its restoration, I mean, I actually drove into town just to go see that. You know, Joel ended up doing his whole branding off of the sign. This is all original. Over here is where the cars would pull in, and they would actually drop their laundry through uh, the windows. We're in the process of just talking about that neon kind of being the beacon to really pulling people even farther in uh, to the west side of, of downtown, and so we hope that that continues. In their tap room, you'll find everything from massive barrel aged stouts to aromatic haze IPAs and to what locals describe as the best light lager in Oklahoma. And in these fermenters that you're seeing right here, we're adding the yeast, and the yeast are what's actually turning that sugar water into beer. But no matter the style, each beer receives the same devotion to quality and consistency. Stone Cloud's innovation is obvious in the hundreds of unique beers they have developed in their relatively short experience. And so from the fermenters, from the, the big conical vessels, it gets pumped into this bright tank, and the bright tank is where we're, we are clarifying and carbonating the beer. 
They are particularly proud of the extensive lagering program and their work with the barrel and wood aging. Because of the pivot project, the own Sunshine Cleaner sign once again lit up the corner of Northwest First and Classen. The building itself does not have to have had some historic event occur in it. It's still a you know historic building that deserves to be saved, I think, and used. It's part of what we were, and what we were somewhat controls what we are. Just because a building is abandoned doesn't mean it's the end of the story. To hear more stories about historic abandoned buildings... Yeah, that's, uh, but I'm still waiting on a check from Stone Cloud. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, <laughs> um, I actually shot all that uh, footage uh, for the Forever Majestic documentary, and um, it ended up being too long uh, with it in there, so I just had all that footage, and I thought I'd just put something together that was kind of fun. So um, I guess I did this slide before the video, so we'll skip right on past that. Um, but why is historic preservation important? I mean, we all know that, um, or it, I, would, uh, I would hope that all of us know that there's the economic value, right? You know, tear something down, goes to the dump, we want to help uh, preserve those resources and cultural pre preser preservation, urban growth. But really what I want to talk about tonight is why do you believe preservation is important because we could talk about all these uh, financial saving things but would preservation of historic buildings be more prominent if we didn't care right if we didn't find some sort of internal value of why why do we believe that his history is important to us and so i believe it's it's the passion it's the art it's the architecture that's so cool to look at it's the neighborhood community something that brings everybody together that feeling that you get when you're in it and when, you, you know, when you're in it. Um, because, like this line says, because our heritage lies within the walls of these beautiful buildings and places, and because it's the right thing to do a lot of times. So my question is, uh, or, so ha has anybody in here been in a fight to save a, a historic building before? A lot of hands went up, yes. So, I mean, we all know some of the, uh, uh, and my, my one regret when I was trying to fight to save the Majestic was I didn't have an impact video to try and help because a lot of the community had a lot of concerns and issues and we couldn't vocalize that very well and just replying on Facebook comments and replying on this. And I wish we just would have put together a comprehensive video that addressed some of these concerns. So the problem that we had in Hot Springs when we were trying to fight to save the Majestic is people were saying it's too far gone. Oh, it's... It's, uh, they just look at some pictures that were online and they see dilapidation, they see peeling paint, they see very fundamentally easy f issues to fix um, in the grand scheme of things. Of course, everything costs money, but um, nobody is interested in investing in it. We actually had three developers that were vocalizing that I want to buy it from the city. I, I have a check. They have the money ready to go. But the city turned turned their eye away and didn't listen to us and therefore the city did as well. So we didn't really get many. And then who cares? Well, that's kind of what we're here to talk about. Who does care? And um, I, w I wish we had more of a showcase of restoration projects similar in condition and size to help show that it is possible, that it's not too far gone. And uh, there's an interview I got with Steve Lackmeyer uh, who was a very uh, vocal voice in the saving of the Skirvin. And so we, while I had that on camera, um, it, was, it was after the fact. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, save, uh, use that to help in the saving. But as far as telling the documentary story, we did use that. Um, but better marketing of interested developers. We should have interviewed them, gotten them to go on camera of some kind, and blasted that out, out onto social media. How can we, how can we help give these buildings a voice through the people who are interested in it and showing the emotional side, interviewing the people who have history there, people who have uh, that emotional tie that can help bridge that story together when we're not just talking about the economic value, we're not just talking about um, the, the, like the historic tax credits and all those things that are very important, but once we have that emotional tie, it can really um, help add that extra voice. So. Um, how do, so how do we draw attention to a building that we love? I mean, of course, we have the research, the documentation, photos, videos, social media, like I mentioned, commercial marketing. But I think most importantly, like what we're here to talk about tonight, and this is the post we did on the OKC post, uh, Public Administration Building, um, is advocacy. 
and using that information to, so this was a building out in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and this was a little video we put together in hopes to try and sway some opinions. There we go. Gracing Fort Smith, Arkansas for nearly a century, St. Scholastica Monastery is in danger of demolition. There are solutions, but the clock is ticking. Construction on this awe-inspiring Gothic Arkansas treasure was completed in May of 1924, and the building was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2006. But that designation will not stop the wrecking ball from eradicating 100 years of history. The Benedictine Sisters of St. Scholastica Monastery have decided to move forward with the demolition of our former monastery building which is scheduled to begin on June 1st. Preserve Arkansas received an emergency $10,000 grant by the National Trust. Preservationists were stunned. Emergency grants are not the norm with the National Trust, but they saw the value of this distinctive structure. The sisters wouldn't have to do anything except for agree to delay the demolition and to allow us to have access to the building and its interior in order for an architect with experience in preservation to come in and assess the building and prioritize the repair needs and provide some rough cost estimates to the sisters just so that they could better understand alternatives to save the building and repurpose it. As of right now, they have not accepted it. Since the early 1970s, the National Trust has been instrumental in saving thousands of buildings from demolition that are on the National Registry by using state and federal historic tax credits. These tax credits, monetized, provide capital specifically for renovation costs, $400,000 from the state, and 25% of the total renovation cost by the federal government. Then there are additional programs. For example, if the building became a senior living facility, there's a wonderful program through HUD providing incentive money adding to the capital stack. Think of it like this. It's like stacking coupons at the grocery store. Each of these pieces can be utilized to pay for redeveloping the building. But as with any governmental agency, there are hoops to jump through and rules to follow. It simply takes a little time and a little effort and a little know-how. And all that starts with just a little bit of communication. There are literally no other examples of Gothic Revival architecture of this quality in the state of Arkansas. St. Scholastica is simply unique. It's important to say also that, that this offer comes from a place of sympathy and understanding for their difficult situation um, in trying to figure out a way to make this work financially, that we're not trying to, to overstep or overreach, but that we're really trying to offer a last, a last resort and to say it's not, it's not too late to change their mind. Um, unfortunately, that is now demolished. So hate to hate to bring it down a little bit, but the sisters, um, they did watch it and they were embedded because of this video. They were, I, mean, I wouldn't say it was just because of this video, but because of all the voices that were being heard and everybody coming together and collectively saying that, um, that this building is important. They just ignored everybody and they kind of took their own. And I, it's understandable, you know, that it was, uh, on a, it was on a piece of land right next to their current monastery. So I can understand where their concerns would be. So I do, while I do understand, uh, we did try to try to help with that video, but unfortunately it is gone now. Um, so again, how do we draw attention to a building that we love? Um, so I think showing that you and so many care, helping to try and get others on your side, presenting your case to the right people, listen, uh, listen to the opposing side and help to address the concerns like we talked about, but also showing potential. And uh, because we can sit there and show images of the dilapidated building all day, but if we don't show any potential or what it could be, there can, uh, that's where uh, I think we also messed up with the Majestic is we had a lot of, uh, we did have a lot of potential, but we, so this is, um, this is a snippet of a little video we did uh, following students 
of the, uh, at the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design, where the students actually drew up plans of how they would renovate and restore abandoned buildings uh, following the codes and doing everything right to help give potential developers an idea of what it would look like. Bathhouse Row sits just on the edge of Hot Springs National Park and can send you on a trip back in time. It features many spring fountains and eight uniquely designed bathhouses. During the downtown's decline, seven of the eight remaining structures were abandoned. Luckily, today all of them have been repurposed as restaurants, hotels, museums, or reopened, all except for one, the Maurice. When the Fordyce was getting built, Billy Maurice kind of like sent spies in and he wanted to know what was being put in. They have nine baths, well now we have 10. This competitive edge really drove like a modern idea of bathing even further into an existence. The National Park Service has been working for a number of years to find a developer to restore this beautiful structure. They have been able to stabilize the building from further damage and opened up the floor plan to provide more space for prospect tenants. They have also installed a modern elevator to help bring the building up to code. I would love if this project sparked something unique. Several students chose the Maurice and presented a wide variety of ideas, including event spaces, hotels, restaurants, and a casino. Callie, a recent graduate of the program, decided to bring her love of art and community space into her project while maintaining the historical features. Here we have the original ceiling of the lobby. and Architecture, it's not just about the four walls and the floor and the ceiling. It's about how to make it for people. That connection between a person and a made environment or a made object, that's the beauty. The beauty is where people connect with it. Her vision sees this building as a multi-purpose function with an art gallery in the sunroom, a sculpture studio, a coffee shop, bar, a restaurant on the second floor, and a spa in the basement where the original pool can still be seen. So, um, I'm not sure what I mean by why me, but like I just wanted to kind of give uh, a, a little bit more of an introduction as to uh, where my motivations kind of come from and why I believe that uh, you know this this is an important topic to cover but uh, on a daily basis I'm actually working with personal injury attorneys um, to help showcase the the their client story of somebody who's been wronged in an accident either wrongful death uh, documentary portraits or uh, settlement videos that uh, shows uh, the pain that they go through every day because of an incident um, we put that together in similarly styled documentaries that are more emotional and so every day I'm interviewing people who have been wronged in certain ways or are dealing with struggles on a daily basis and and I thought how can we apply similar thoughts or similar type interviews to to things uh, to help uh, in everyday fights and so I just have a, a passion for documentary filmmaking and interviewing people hearing their stories um, and I believe every building deserves a second chance. Maybe not every one, you know, I think maybe there's a couple of old sheds that maybe are just built with, you know, but um, for, for the most part, every building that's abandoned and has a story to tell always has a second chance if, you, if, uh, if the right person comes along. So why can't we make a video that's compelling, informative, and emotional to help us in our efforts? Um, so I, uh, an impact film that, a ca uh, that makes a case for everyone that needs to see it. Uh, my goal is to show developers what are out there and uh, why they are ready for restoration, um, convince the individuals who believe in historic preservation that saving this building is the right way to go, um, and an impact is made when a watcher feels something and maybe even changes their mind. Um, an impact is made when the watcher is driven to action. Um, an impact is made when the watcher is inspired to follow other historic preservation projects. And I'm going to stay on this slide for just a second because it looks like somebody's taking a photo of me uh, for social media itself. So when we're talking about marketing uh, and things like that, so uh, this is going to be important for that. So um, let me know when I'm going to change the slide. Okay, good? All right. <laughs> so, um, but uh, this, is a, this was a Forever Majestic screen at a documentary film festival in, um, in somewhere in Texas. But... Um, this was a room full of people who have never heard about the Majestic Hotel or Hot Springs, and I can't count on maybe three hands, you know, where somebody came up to me afterwards and, you know, and, and this isn't, 
uh, I don't say this as like, oh, I did such a great job, but like it was, I made Forever Majestic because I loved that building. I thought it could have been restored and I was sick to my stomach that it couldn't have been. And to have a whole room of people sit there and agree with me who have never heard of that building made a difference in my eyes and said, how can we get other people who have never heard of the buildings that we're currently fighting for, maybe out of state, maybe they're located elsewhere. Maybe there's a developer who lives in New York that sees potential in an Oklahoma City location. We never know what's out there until we can figure out getting it in front of that right person. So have these people film festival people? Oh, these people? Yeah. Yes. So they, these people that's were all. Right there. That's why. That's why. Yeah. That's they it. like the film in old buildings. Mm -hmm. They see the appreciation. Of exactly. It. Exactly. And, you know, the, the, uh, there's a lot of firsthand accounts and, um, in that film as well. But yes, great point. Um, that love pe people love historic buildings. Um, so interviewing, you know, for, for the fight or just to share a piece of history that is no more because uh, documentaries can, can be done in so many different ways, whether, like I said, it's that impact film to fight or it's a building that has already been demolished, but there's a lot of records and accounts of people who still remember it and, and can, why, why not make a, if you have a passion for a place or something that speaks to you, why not try to get the people who are involved or who are a part of that story to, to tell you all about it. And, you know, whether you're a documentary filmmaker yourself, there are things that you can do to follow those breadcrumbs and, and, and find the story and, and just tell something that you're passionate about. And so um, I believe that anybody can do it. Um, anybody can interview somebody. You don't need the big camera setup that I have there. Um, but as an interviewer, it's always important to ask every question that's possible, especially if it's somebody who might be a little older. We don't know how much time they have left and they're one of the last remaining people that can help kind of help tell that story. You know, so whether you're planning to put it together a documentary in five years or not, why not get it right, you know, when you can, you know, but anytime I put in a video together, usually it's the voiceover, let's talk about the facts, you know, and the interviews convey that emotion that we talk about. Um, so this is a video, this is a snippet of a video, or it's not even a snippet of video because it's just a raw interview. But I'm working, um, the Abandoned Atlas Foundation, or I'm working on a video right now about Townley's Dairy. Anybody remember Townley's Dairy? So this is Guy Townley. He, he was uh, the last generation of Townleys to, who ran and operated the store. And he's the person who decided to close it. And I was nervous to ask him, why did Townley's close? How did that happen? I mean even though, well, right. But um, I asked him and uh, his response, uh, I was not expecting. How did it make you feel that Townley's closed and the plant was- Oh, I was really probably have to talk to my wife to get a better feel for that. I, I was devastated. I didn't know what to do. I felt, uh, felt like a complete failure. One business development, I, I, in a sense, I didn't blame myself totally, um, but again, I can't deny that I wasn't around, and maybe if I'd have fought harder with my dad and, and uncle, we might have done something a little bit different, and things may have been different and changed and all, but I didn't. And so we got to that, got to that point, uh, and... Uh, May, I guess I'd have to say maybe I just gave up too easily. I don't know. Even though his interview was an hour and a half, we sat there and talked forever. And this is a prime example of what I'm talking about. Because if you, if you have um, a passion for something, and I first discovered Townley's in its abandonment. I didn't know Townley's existed before it was already shut down. And something kept drawing me to go back to it and go back to it and take photo after photo. And I have so many clips of it just in its abandonment. And um, I knew that um, even my mom would tell me that her school would go there on field trips sometimes. So that was always quite interesting. And I even have a little collection at home. But you can see he actually has a little collection over here that I put in the background. But it's sometimes when I ask people to be interviewed and I'm like, hey, I'd love to talk to you about this thing that you probably haven't talked about in years, um, I'm always nervous because like, I want to talk with them for a long time and I don't know how much time they're willing to give me. But 
it's so it's it's happened time and time again when I just ask somebody they like him he told me he only had 15 minutes and it turned into an hour and a half because he hadn't talked about it in years and um, and uh, he went on to tell me all about the process of making the milk and and all the different productions and um, and so many things that I never even knew about Townley's and now um, I don't know what I'm uh, like. I'm still putting that video together, and it's very difficult because he just said so much about the the milk deliveries, and uh, I think there was even a point where he mentioned that uh, he had a like a key ring of all the all the places he would deliver. He had like just a whole ring of keys because people would let him into the house to put the milk in the refrigerator, and uh, I always found that really fascinating. But my point is, um, you never know what you're going to get when somebody gives you their time of day, and so if you know of a building that's currently or, you know, there's a story there. Get the first-hand accounts while you can. You can always do something with it later. And the best way to do that, you can always uh, use your, use your uh, phone, voice memos, iPhone. You know, there's a lot of ways to capture things nowadays. You don't have to have that big camera, like I said. Uh, but following the breadcrumbs. You know, a lot of people, when you interview somebody, they might know somebody else who can tell another part of the story. And that's how that happened. Um, and so then he introduced me to her, and she was actually answering phones at Townley's at six years old. Um, and she was answering, helping take sales calls and things, and you know, she was very excited to talk about it. Um, but I, like, this is one of my favorite points, you know, letting them talk. It's not rambling. To me, it's documentation. Oftentimes, they haven't talked about it in years. So let them talk. Let them, let them, uh, let them be their thing. So this, oh. So the reason I bring that up, though, is because um, this, the following snippet of the video you're about to see, um, I interviewed somebody about two years ago, and I'm glad I did, um, and you'll find out why. Carl Lehman was only eight years old when his father bought the store in 1958. The most fascinating thing about this particular building is none of the original features have been replaced since the 1920s when it was constructed. Upon their new purchase, the Laymans put up a sign on the tin porch roof reading Layman and Sons Grocery and left everything else the same. They continued selling groceries, farm accessories, fishing supplies, tools, and other general merchandise. This little store ended up not only serving as a merchant for goods, but also serviced cars. It became a bus stop for nearby towns and, of course, APCO gas and oil products. This started a few years into the new ownership given that APCO was founded after Anderson Pritchard Oil Corporation, founded in 1922, were officially permitted to use the anacronym in 1960. And in 74, the oil embargo hit, and they cut our gas off. We couldn't get no gas, hardly at all. They cut us down from 30,000 gallons a month down to 3,000 gallons a month. And couldn't get, we sold a lot of farm diesel. We couldn't get any diesel at all. We couldn't afford to, those little pumps just roll up to 49 cents as high as they'll go. We couldn't afford to replace them because we couldn't get enough gas to pay to, pay to replace them. And we stayed open until 1980, so we just uh, locked it up and, and quit. <laughs> the movie starring Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman featured two brothers traveling across the country. One of the filming locations took place at the W.S. Kelly General Merchandise APCO station in the tiny town of Kogar, Oklahoma. In the scene featuring the layman store, the two stars stop at a phone booth to make a phone call. The phone booth was a prop put in place by the producers. The scene was filmed on June 2, 1988. About a hundred people from all over the area came to watch the filming and meet the stars. Until 2020, the building remained untouched and still has everything in it from the day it closed. Price tags on unsold sunglasses, refreshments in the refrigerator, and records dating all the way back to the W.S. Kelly era. Unfortunately, because of this, many vandals have broken in over the years and stolen a number of items. Carl lived in the family house directly behind the store since his family first moved there in 1958 until 2012, when the upkeep became too much. Carl still lives nearby with the hopes of one day saving this little piece of history he grew up with.
As our first restoration project in 2020, we had the opportunity to help clean up the store and repaint what we could reach on the exterior sign. While we had plans to finish the whole sign, our budget ran out to reach that level safely and non-destructive to the historic nature. Carl Lehman, the last known connection to this charming and mysterious establishment, sadly passed away on Monday, July 4th, 2022. While the future of the store is uncertain, Carl and his family, along with the legacy established there, will live on in the store and the legend of Kogar and Carl's dreams. An effort to try and keep the store alive will not be forgotten. I almost put off that interview with Carl and that whole video he gave instances of who W.S. Kelly was. He talked about a lot of other things. Main, th main reason I didn't actually include all that in the video is because uh, I only have an hour. So uh, I didn't want to put everything in there. But the, um, I'm very glad I got that interview because, uh, and I sat on it. And I, I, I had intentions of doing a video. And when I learned of his passing, I quickly, uh, I wouldn't say quickly, but I, I was able to put something together to help honor the memory of that store and his legacy. At least I hope it was. So, um, like I said, use your phone, video, voice memos, um, but keeping it somewhere safe is always important too, because you can record it, but uh, with us living in the digital age, things disappear. But there's great online resources if you just upload it to YouTube as an unlisted link, you can, it will be there um, until YouTube no longer exists, which uh, since it's owned by Google, probably won't happen for a while. Um, but uh, you can always download it later. Uh, and use it whenever it's ready to go so you don't have to use your own storage if you don't have a lot. Um, you never know what you're gonna get when you're gonna need it. Um, so this is, uh, when we talk about the emotional side, when we talk about what drives people to, to see places like this, this is a scene, this is actually a scene from Forever Majestic when we learned that, um, when we learned something and then... Uh, oh, that the state pays for the architecture I'm suggesting that Preserve Arkansas and- They pay for that. Yeah. The city don't, it didn't cost us Correct. anything. Correct. And if that comment of it can be saved and it's documented, you're more likely to get developers in. We haven't we, discussed we, the motion. It, the motion table. failed. It failed. There were still questions I'm about that. I'm trying my best to get to call the roll. <laughs> <laughs> Not presumptuous at all, please do it. Resolution R-16-105, a resolution awarding a contract to Demolition Technology Specialized Services, Inc. of Tulsa, Oklahoma for abatement and demolition activities at the Majestic Hotel. Jones? Aye. Clark? Reluctantly, yes. Williams? Aye, with a heavy heart. Ramick? Yes. Folly? Aye. Davidson? I abstain. Carney? Yes. Thank you. Motion passed. It is passed. Thank you so much. was my home. And to see what had happened to it was, was really hard. And I worked back there behind the front desk, um, ran these halls up and back and forth to the other section of the hotel. And it was a, it was a special place, a special time. My dad would have, it would have been destroyed his soul to see it in that shape. Because that hotel was his pride and joy. Let's do that. Okay. Can you look at me? He had poured his, you know, all of his work into all those years. And, and he just, and he really loved it. He loved the Majestic. We all did. It was. It was just such a big part of our lives. Come on. This is it. This is the last time we'll probably be up here together. Yeah, I Maybe you can make do me something. look pretty. I'm doing <laughs> it. I am. It's easy. I can do it. Nearly 28 months 
later, it is official. The iconic Majestic Hotel is coming down. Tonight, the board of directors unanimously voted to tear it down. And for anybody interested in possibly seeing the documentary, it does not end there. The fight actually continues after this. So um, I won't tell you what happens, though. Um, so I've kind of developed, uh, like, I, over the, I've probably interviewed over 500 people in my career so far. And uh, there's little tips and tricks that I've found out over the years. So uh, these are little tips, uh, these are little things that I've kind of picked up over the year. Um, not the year, my career. Um, but, um, Actually, no, is this it? I mean, these are pretty standard questions, but um, um, one of the things that I've always learned is uh, sometimes if you ask the same question later in the interview when the energy has shifted, because when you, when you first ask something like, what connects you, what, how are you connected to the project, or what does this building mean to you, and as, that, as they talk more and more about it, and you can start to see they have some tears developing in their eyes or you can hear them really getting passionate about it. If you ask them that question again, um, why does this building mean so much to you? You'll get a completely different answer than the beginning of the interview. And sometimes that's been, that's the interview you just saw with Lisa, that exact method was used. Um, where um, we started at the beginning, I said, what does the majestic mean to you? She said, oh, it was so fun because I got to grow up there and things like that. And then she got to talking about her parents. She got to talking about what, what the emotional tie was, and then I asked her again, and I got that answer. So um, that's one of the little tips and tricks I use, um, but just being there. But again, just because it's abandoned doesn't mean it. And this, this is one of those, again, you don't know what you're going to get until you get it. And uh, we did a little documentary on the Paige Woodson restoration uh, here in Oklahoma City. Uh, and this was, uh, I was interviewing Gina Shofala, who was the project manager of that, and um, she wasn't just the project manager of that. You could really hear how important this project was to her, and I decided to put it at the end of the video because I... What would it have meant to you if the old Douglas School was demolished? It occurs to me and has occurred to me while I was working on this project that built environment reinforces your existence every day. You, you see it, you, you experience it. Unconsciously, it tells you that you're significant. When African-American communities are torn down, places of historical significance are torn down, it reinforces that we're insignificant, that our history doesn't matter. If you think about it, when something is torn down, how long does it take before you have forgotten that it ever existed? I am very passionate that when you tear down my history, you tear down my children's future. They don't see it. I can tell them about it, but it means so much more when I can take them someplace and let them see and feel that history. Most of our city really does understand now uh, historic preservation is really important. It brings vibrancy to the city. It, it adds interest to our city. It, it communicates to others that they were significant, that they were important, that they create things of beauty, that they are relevant and they were relevant uh, to society. So this is the first Christian church, or what was left of it. Um, we, uh, actually in cooperation with uh, Denise Castelli, who's back there, she, I was out of town, unfortunately, whenever the first Christian church was mysteriously demolished, and I was like, oh my gosh, we gotta get out there. I wanted to get out there and tell that story if we could. Um, and in the process of doing that, we ran across somebody, uh, well, actually we were, sorry, we didn't just randomly run across her, but I had asked her there, because we were in communication about talking about uh, the First Christian Church because they, uh, there was a buyer interested who communicated with us on our Abandoned Oklahoma page and said that they wanted our help in some way. Um, I don't remember exactly how, but we were trying to help them find a way to, uh, they had made a, well, 
I'll just kind of skip right to the, so we interviewed this person who you're about to meet. Um, okay, here we are, we'll go. Okay, your name. My name is Cindy Scarberry. I'm the executive director of the Opry Heritage Foundation of Oklahoma. And we're here at the property of First Christian Church at 36th and Walker um, on a very, very sad morning, a very sad day for us. Uh, we had thought that we would be purchasing this property. That was our, our plan. And we're very just heartbroken, shocked, and saddened uh, to find out today uh, that it's gone. And so, uh, yeah, it's been a long <laughs> journey for you to get here. How yes. long have you all been anticipating? Well, you know, I had started looking at this property uh, during the pandemic when we found out that we were going to need a new home mm -hmm. um, and so started looking at it, but we really didn't get very serious until June of this year. We hired uh, HDK 45 Ventures. We hired developers to help us find the right property. Uh, in July, our board voted that we were going to pursue this specific property, put together a uh, letter of intent, and sent that to the church. They asked for proof of funds, and so before they would let us get in and do our due diligence, um, and so we actually got to tour the church last month and were given no indication that demolition was even on the books or in the one of the plans. Um, they asked us for those proof of funds. We were able to get that on September 16th, submitted that to them and, and thought, honestly, we thought today we were going to begin our capital campaign and start making all the announcements. Uh, we have hired Schnocky Turbo Frank. Uh, to help us with a feasibility study. They have interviews set starting next week to ask the neighborhood and ask the community and ask historical uh, societies that were really interested in saving this building. We had interviews set up with them to make sure that our plans were gonna go along with what the community wanted and that what the community needed. And so now we are back to square one. Um, so I'm not sure what we're going to do about those interviews, um, but we will still be looking for our forever home and doing our capital campaign. Um, it's just a, pretty hard this morning and today um, because we had such a vision for the community for this space. Well, and Denise, how long did you talk to her? I have, what to say? How long did you talk to her again? Uh, And so, yeah, we're, the reason it's in its raw format right now and not in its edited way is because we haven't edited it yet. But I thought it was an important piece to plug because I know in this group here, we cared so much about it. And, um, and I, I always found it very fascinating that literally the night before we were talking about, you know, um, talking about this and, and then all of a sudden it just, it caught us all off guard as we all know. So. Um, Building your story. So once you do have your content, what do you do with it? Um, editing is, is the hardest part because if you have all these raw footage, like the guy from Townley's, that raw format, how do, you, how do you put it all together? Well, that's a whole separate class. I'm not gonna get into that, but essentially, if you have a, really at the end of the day, if you have a passion for a building or someone, you know, piece it together the way that you want them or it to be portrayed. Someone will listen. Um, and I'm in the boat that um, I'm happy and I'm so thankful that um, what I get to do every day, not historical buildings, but I, I somehow managed to make a living out of telling stories for people, either through it's a celebration of life documentary through somebody who's recently passed away and we put together a little mini documentary about who they were um, f for either the funeral or for after as a keepsake or to help somebody tell their story through a personal injury attorney and their clients, a wrongful death portrait of what happened, who was at fault, and, um, or about a building that needs to be saved and a building that needs a voice, or a building that is no more, that somebody, like when um, somebody hears about Townleys, my goal is that I wanna make a video, even though Townleys itself was not a very architecturally interesting building to look at, 
it was, um, but I think it was such an important part of Oklahoma's history, Oklahoma City's history, and in that idea of an independent dairy being able to uh, go through World War II. And so many, I mean, there were like 200 dairies here in Oklahoma City at one point, and it survived all of that. And then uh, to have it brought down the way it was, which will be featured in the video, was uh, certainly, certainly sad to hear. So whether it's, whether we're helping with nominate, like, I, and I'm also looking to find what, more ways that video can help in any way it can, whether, I'd, I'm just spitballing out here, I know this is gonna be completely wrong, but if there's like, I don't know if it would help with nominations of any kind or throwing out, but advocacy of like, hey, somebody needs a new roof. You know, they're, they're doing a GoFundMe or trying to find funding or get grants for a roof. Like, why not put something together that helps share your vision that's not just a PowerPoint and capture people who are connected with that building who can, who can help, in it, not even somebody who has history there, but somebody who just has that passion, who has that willing to, uh, to say, I want to do something, um, and how can we best convey that to an audience that wants to listen. Um, so this last video I'm gonna play, and then the presentation's essentially over, um, is a small highlight reel I put together of a lot of the projects that I've been able to work on, and it's just like, it takes you through a little, little pieces and nuggets of some of the projects I've been able to happily work on. So this is the last thing, and I'll close out with questions. Here at the Abandoned Atlas Foundation, we work hard to spread awareness and connect developers to places that are historic and at risk of the wrecking ball. Discoveryland came to a sudden end in the summer of 2011. A few years later, in 2014, it was officially announced that it would be closed for good. After an eventful and impactful career, the legendary radio host who touched the lives of all the citizens of Newport, Al Evans, passed away at the age of 47 from a sudden heart attack. We celebrated our 25th anniversary on Saturday night, and he died Sunday. Oh. Um. We started our festivities off with a traditional beauty pageant, and Danielle Foley was crowned as the Tiny River Princess. The title of Little River Princess went to Donna Falk, and Junior River Princess title was won by Stacy Ivy, and our beautiful riverboat queen was Katherine Harris. And here are all of the beautiful royalty together. Folks really got into the spirit of the thing, using hands and being just a little bit overstuffed. And when it really got down to serious, you just dug in and stuffed your mouth. Well, I grew up there. Walking in in the afternoon, Bud leaning on the counter, Daddy leaning on the counter. There were always men who came and drank coffee. Just the hustle and bustle of that. And led off by the Legion of Honor. I don't know, watching, you know, Dad do his thing and getting to be a part of that with him. This is a place that people truly cherished and it's, it's iconic, it really is. He sits down in your chair. It is a home for not just singers and songwriters, but musicians. It's where a lot of people learn to play and get their first experience on stage. But the Opry is the reason why I am the performer I am today. We shall be free. Being young and playing here with an amazing band and amazing singers, it molded me without anybody even trying to. For the very last time, and nobody One of the probably saddest issues up there is the old bowling alley. The old bowling alley we used quite often for the students. It was all wooden balls, all wooden pins. You had to set your own pins, but they would actually bowl. And I wish we could have saved that because you don't see any bowling alleys like that anymore. So 
we've got a big announcement. Um, I know there's been a lot of buzz and a lot of questioning about this lately, but we are officially building a new office. The good news is we're not moving far. In fact, we're moving right next door. So the old bottling plant, the Clem bottling plant, that's going to be our new home. OKCPS has begun a partnership of sorts with the OKC Urban Renewal Authority, offering closed schools for undeveloped land. This put the Urban Renewal Authority partly in charge of bringing developers into the area to revitalize the derelict buildings. We're going to work tirelessly to get people inside those buildings so that it can add value to the neighborhoods. In 2019, a million-dollar deal was made with Carpathia, a partnership between the Ross Group and Nelson and Stowe Development of Tulsa to turn the OKCPS administration property into a hotel, brewery, and mix of retail and restaurants. I have experience of over 20 developments in Oklahoma and a vast majority of being the historical renovations. This was a deal pitched by a credible team with years of experience, including a recently redeveloped Tulsa Club in downtown Tulsa and an array of hotels, housing, restaurants, bars, and entertainment venues, and receiving tons of community backing for the proposal. In the spring semester of 2021, the University of Arkansas's Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design decided to help bring attention to a number of these at-risk structures. I wanted to set up a challenge for the students where they could have more agency to set them up for their next stage of entering into their profession of architecture or interior design. When I got to Arkansas, I ran into a situation here in Pine Bluff that was kind of appalling to me because at that time they were trying to float a tax to restore the Sanger Theater. You have some more banking officials that are, in, that, that are involved in that also. And uh, they want to maintain control. This is their plantation. Even though I live here, I'm not gonna be a slave on their plantation. One of the things that's left is the Army-Navy Hospital downtown. It has a huge presence overlooking Central Avenue. And a lot of people are interested in restoring that place. And some people, you know, specifically want to know what they can do uh, to get a lease on that place, to purchase that place, or it's just like the general public wants to see it restored also. But whatever the case, you know, the first thing that's got to happen is the ownership of that property has to be figured out. And right now, uh, Preserve Arkansas and other groups locally in Hot Springs are trying to help facilitate the process of, of this happening. And it's an issue where the federal government and the state of Arkansas were kind of doing this tug of war and, and dance maybe is a better way to put it, um, over who was gonna end up with the property once the state decided that they no longer wanted to use it as the Arkansas Rehabilitation Services Facility. We have a temporary home right now and we're looking for the future home and it's like I, I always reminisce on, on for me what it used to be because it was you know it was most of my childhood was in this building. I want that for another young kid because there's nothing like it. So this is the neighborhood and the community that I came to and grew up. And this site came to the forefront as being extremely important to the community. Just before all hope was lost, Jason and Kayla Shipman, two Sand Spring natives, purchased the property in 2019 in hopes of making the 525 acres their dream ranch. Jason and Kayla are the most perfect people to take over Discoveryland Ranch and make it something unique. I think this is special. I think having weddings here and creating memories and new life is all in the same valve of what WT always envisioned with Discoveryland. I was always so sad that this place was just dying and that the, the, the shipments have brought it back to life and made that a possibility for our, our town or our region. Is, is very exciting for me. You know, I think it's gonna be terrific. It can't, can't be anything but terrific.
Finally, after a long and difficult journey, the National Park Services has restored and renovated the building into their regional headquarters and has opened a museum inside to educate and commemorate the long history that took place along this railway. Today is the official groundbreaking of the depot project and I am ecstatic to be here. It may be a dream deferred, but it's not a dream denied. And there's so many people here today who worked on, who imagined what we are doing today. And to finally say it's here is just, you know, let you know that, hey, dreams do become reality. Let's save the gold dome. <laughs> just, just because it's banned, it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. Thank you so much for your time. Any questions? Any uh, thoughts? Questions? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. When you're putting together one of these documentaries with the purpose of saving the building, knowing that you know it's going to go to the city planners or developers or or people who maybe have some money to contribute, like what's your what's your like like what do you, what is the intention span of somebody? Or, um. It kind of changes per, like, what we normally do is we'll, we'll put the story together the way that it's built out and uh, whether that's a minute, whether it's a little longer, but we'll always make, like, 30-second versions, 15-second spots because we understand that social media, there are those attention spans that need to be addressed. And so making various, like, 15-second spots where it's not... Um, so we, we put it together multiple ways. It's not just, like, here's the video and that's it. So there's, um, while the snippets we looked at today were the lengthier versions, all of them, uh, depending on what it's being used for, can be turned into whatever the attention span needs to be. Um, and that's one of my things. I don't, I love when my interviews are an hour long and I find that perfect 15 seconds that makes it work. You know, I, I don't think, I know I'm gonna make it 15 seconds, therefore I only need a minute worth of interviews because you never know what you're going to get. So uh, does, does that answer your question? So it, it kind of ranges. It just depends on what the needs are. But they can range anywhere from 15 seconds to, you know, a 22-minute do documentary that just I make just for fun that who knows who's, who knows who's going to see it. And then Majestic was a feature length. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Forever Majestic is an hour and 26 minutes, but it's not just like a, in 1902. It actually, uh, that's about five minutes of the documentary. Um, and the rest of it is the, is the fight, and we ran into like city corruption, a mysterious fire, crooked dealers in town. So like that, it's kind of a roller coaster, I'm not gonna lie. So, um, yes? Can you get with the um, city or part of this building that you're trying to say, get with the uh, owners, which usually is the city, mm -hmm. and um, find out what their future plans are for the city itself? Hear about the growth and hear about because they're never going to say, "Oh well, we're going to decline and we're we're losing left and right." So, you know, here we are. No, take their own words, take their own information, and say, "You know what? We got the myriad sitting down here, and it's just an eyesore. It's sitting there empty. It's a piece of junk. Blah blah blah. We built it back in the '80s, whatever, or '70s, and now guess what? Very served. Now guess what? We got we got." Paycom is buying the building, and they're going to bring all these people down here, which is going to make this city blossom even more, because now all of a sudden they can buy and live in these areas around here if they can afford them, you know, yeah. and they're paying pretty well at Paycom. Yeah, I guess they... Paycom has been growing, and it, doesn't, it hasn't slowed down yet. It continues to grow. So if you can get some of the city leaders to brag about their city, use their own words to say, this is why we can save this because that's a geodesic dome. Did you know Bucky Fuller is the one who came up with this idea, you know, this process? How many other places are this in the, in the world? How many other places are this? We don't need to turn this into a museum. No. We can turn this into a working building that fits our needs today. Not yeah. we're trying to preserve it. If you only try to be preserved, you'll never win that battle. I, uh, I'm a firm believer in that uh, I, I think there's, there should be a level of compromise in, in historic preservation where like maybe, I mean, it's great to try and save everything that we can, but like if it means like demolition. That, totally different than places of yeah. business. They still yeah, but, have to have somebody producing an income in here to be able to support all that. Have you ever thought about how much it costs just to, the electricity this in one month? I mean, 
you got to make, it's got to be a profitable business. Okay, so there were like 20 questions in there. Which one? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you don't have to answer all my questions. Oh, okay. These are, these are, these are thoughts. Yeah, so the answer, is, the answer is the, really the caveat to this whole interview. It's like people are, have to be willing to go on camera. So I don't know if that, you know, like I, for they some of the. Do what? They put it in print. Well, no, I mean, but they, the we have to. On the record. Yeah, I mean, if, if someone does go on print, I mean, I don't see why they wouldn't go on camera saying it. But yeah, it's uh, to interview somebody who we need to know. You know, and sometimes, ultimately, there's a building that is sitting there, right? And that, and everyone passes by it every day, like, why is this abandoned right here? Like, so part of that marketing might be, let's release a video showing what we're planning to do, and here's why we're not, you know, getting that's it done I'm right now. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, so like, let's, let's publicly announce, like, hey, it's gonna take us two years to get things off the ground, and here's why. So don't, just because we own it, doesn't mean we're gonna start renovation tomorrow. And I think that's part of, you know, why these videos might be important too, to help help the public understand that, just give us some time, you know. Here's, here's right here in Oklahoma City. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I see. You're obviously very familiar with hot springs. And this is just a personal point of curiosity. Uh, what's up with the doctor across from the arm? Anything going on with that? Medical arts building? Yeah. In fact, uh, yes, it is being turned in. So there was a, across from the Arlington Hotel, there was a, a Art Deco, um, building um, called the Medical Arts Building and uh, in fact the owners of that building right now are featured in the documentary they tried to buy the Majestic from that crooked dealer I was talking about yeah. and they it, was, it turned up being super sketchy but they bought the Medical Arts instead and they're turning it into an Aloft by Marriott and they've hired me to do a documentary on its restoration so I'm very excited about that it's under restoration right now so cool. yes Yes, there, I think there are several several departments on that. I th uh, I think there are a few people in this room that could speak yeah, on that. And, yeah, there's an historic preservation commission <laughs> for the city of Oklahoma City. But at the end of the day, honestly, it comes down to who owns the building and what they want to do. Right. We can advocate all day long, but if the owner of uh, First Christian Church, First Christian Church, or Gold Dome wants to tear it down, listen, it's, it's going to happen. Right? So how do we? Yeah, I want to say about First Christian Church. One of the people that I interviewed uh, that morning was a architecture student who was taking a class online, and he was taking it from the parking lot of the First Christian Church every day. He went there, and he did. He was taking a class on the actual uh, roof dome roofs, like specifically that type of architecture. And that roof structure at the First Christian Church was the only one of its kind in the world, okay? So the iconic value of that, watching that, I think that yeah. is, you know, yeah, I, somebody needs to be thinking Of all the clips that I show, like, I, I wish I could show everything because it's, I, I mean, we've, um, but uh, any, any other questions? How do you get the, Because they were going to tear that. Yeah, and awesome. I worked with the group that saved the Center Theater, which became our art museum. Wow. Beautiful building. Uh, I've, I've been with the group on the Gold Dome. And so, you, you, the mighty dollar, you know, we lost that beautiful bank over on May Avenue because we need another energy. And then we got to make sure that we have a wall free with costs from CBS on everyone. Yeah. And so, you know, we just get this cookie cutter. Raising process that goes through, and this this building has just struggled for so long. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still up. Like, goodness, but I mean, it's like, yeah. It is iconic, and there's a lot of value there. And you know what's interesting about that? I'm sure you saw, but whenever First Christian Church was demolished, uh, the owners of the Gold Dome came out publicly and said, "No, no, no, don't worry, we're not next. We're not yeah, demolishing yeah, it. Don't worry, yeah, don't worry. No, no, we're not doing it." But did you know the Opry looked at this, looked at the building as well? Uh, did, did they? Did they, Chantry? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, they, they, I, I, like, Lear, tell you. Well, I would say, I would say confidently, Lear Theater of Oklahoma looked at the property as well um, as a potential new home for their theater for young audiences, for their academy. It's a 
problematic. Yeah. Now it's going to just it's going to take the right vision. It's going to take a great adaptive reuse yeah. to bring it back to life. So. But I will say that Opry also looked at the Yukon Cinema 5 over there in Yukon, and that, um, they actually halted demolition specifically so that Opry could look at it, but that, um, they were asking for too much is what they... Um, I, what I the, think a great documentary for you as an educational piece would be to show what happens when you have a situation like this and you don't have a I, I moved here 25 years ago and moved from New Mexico where everything was pretty homogenized. You know, right. Pueblo, and I came here and I fell in love with Solomon Layton's architecture and all this other stuff. And then to realize how much stuff they tore down. And then they got lost. And it yeah. was still the potential because the center theater was going to be torn down to be a parking lot. Because that they is. They wanted their lunch break like 15 feet closer than where they just. That would be. Yeah. That would be a very, very powerful documentary, and what it, what it boils down to right now, like, uh, I guess fortunately my company is growing and expanding. I'm actually up to my eyeballs at work every day, so, I mean, I would love to do a lot of these, these things for free, but, uh, you know, nowadays I, I, have to, I have to have some sort of funding, so if you know of any funding sources, I'd be more than happy to jump right on that project. I think you tie in and put a group together from some of the universities and get some students. Absolutely. Yeah. People, I hear more and more people want to know about that architectural, in, that, in, that influence that that particular era of architecture had on Oklahoma. I hear it all the time. We lost the YMCA building, which was yeah. the only international architect. Yeah. When I saw that. That was, that was a, it could come back in the now. Yeah. 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 Um, well, thank you guys so much for time. If, if nobody else, does anybody else have any? Questions or? If you're looking for funding, you learn about 501c3. Abandoned Atlas Foundation is that. Uh, Aban Aban Abandoned Atlas Foundation is a 501c3. Well, then what's the problem? There's tons of money out there. Yeah. Well, there's no money. There's no money. Preservation is Oklahoma. Everyone, everyone's competing for the same amount of money. That's the problem. For a small yeah. amount of money, there are thousands of 501c3s competing for those, for those dollars. I was on the Oklahoma website. Thank you. They say, come see us, come tell us what you need, what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I brought that same issue to a place down in Norman, and uh, all of a sudden, bells and whistles went off, and uh, they got the money, they got the funding. Uh, you know, no is always going to be no, so. Yeah. Is that kind of negative? Be negative, but it's yeah, like, exactly. hey, you know what, you're right. That's tax money. It goes to Washington, D.C., or we can keep it here in Oklahoma. Right. Yeah. Are you talking about Continental Oil? Continental, yeah, owned by Harold Harold Pan. Okay, good to know. Yeah, go on his website. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I can't wait to look at this on the presentation. Uh, and speaking of adaptive reuses and, and uh, great renovations, tomorrow up in the Britain District here in Oklahoma City, the Ritz Theater reopens um, as a distillery, and they're having specials all. All, all day long starting at noon. So I know where I will be tomorrow evening trying some new whiskeys. In town. So, um, thanks for coming. Obviously, you don't have to go home just yet, but I will be kicking you out at 8 p.m. So,